title implies um, we're going to talk about carbon chemistry and its role in river quarter hydrobiogen chemistry. And I'll tell you what I mean by this, about those terms in just a moment. One thing I'm going to really emphasize at the talk is a, a perspective of doing research where we understand fundamental processes and move those into predictive numerical simulation models to ultimately enable prediction of ecosystem function, in particular in response to future perturbation. So uh, to get started, this sort of, sort of the jargon of my title, a river corridor, just to give you a sense of what I mean by that, is this is a, a satellite image of, you okay? Oh, okay. Satellite image of the Columbia River in eastern Washington, and you can see the river itself. The river corridor is really that, plus the, the surrounding uh, land surface, subsurface sub sediments, vegetation, that whole collective system together. And hydrobiogenic chemistry is really an important concept in that system's perspective, which is really an umbrella term of linking together chemical, physical, and biological processes within the river corridor, really broader, in a, a broader watershed context. The important point here is this term is led by hydra, so hydrology. And we often think about these systems as a lot of the interesting biology and chemistry follows from the hydrology. You can't really do biology or chemistry without water. And so that's a theme that will come up a few times at the talk. I want to acknowledge that this is part of a very, it's a small piece I'm going to tell you about, of a very large research program at PNL that I co-lead with Tim Shaibi, Xin Yan Chen, and Maui Kuang. And I'll do acknowledgments kind of on the fly uh, throughout the talk. So why river corridors and ultimately watersheds? And the reason is that river corridors are a really important component of watersheds, and watersheds themselves organize terrestrial landscapes. As you can see in this nice image, this is the Mississippi watershed, the Columbia watershed, uh, Colorado here. And uh, watersheds, the, the functioning of watersheds are really critical for human society. They, they provision uh, clean water, they provide habitat for fish and other organisms, uh, and they really influence and govern the fluxes of material and energy through ecosystems. And so, if you can understand those fundamental processes and put those into models and be able to predict the function of watersheds, any one of these, looking at a watershed context then allows you to start to scale up to larger and larger scales, ultimately to the global Earth system. And so, within the watersheds, kind of have to zoom back down, uh, we often think about these in terms of the, the human alterations and how human alterations impact the functioning of watersheds. And this is the Columbia River Basin, you work kind of right over here. The yellow dots are major dams throughout the basin. And a key point here is those dams really influence how water moves through a watershed. And as I was saying, our, we really focus on hydrobiogenic chemistry, so the movement of that water is a first order control of everything else we're interested in. And kind of zooming in a little bit further, we often think about and focus on something called hydrologic exchange flows in the context of river corridors <coughs> and watersheds. And what that is, is basically if you think about a stream, water moving down a river, a stream, when that water hits an island, for example, it will often go under the island, or part of the water will go under the island, through the subsurface sediments, and emerge later on down the stream. So that water is exchanging from the surface through the subsurface and back out. And this is really an important part of our research program, an important part of river corridor functions, understanding these exchange flows. In particular, they have all kinds of impacts on how that whole corridor, the whole corridor as a system functions. They can enhance biogeochemical function, they can support riparian vegetation, they can influence how much energy and greenhouse gases come off the landscape. They can modulate surface water temperatures, which is very important for fish. And uh, more generally, these zones of exchange can contribute up to 96% of the respiration of the biogeochemical activity within river and ecosystems. So they're a really important critical piece of river corridors and in turn watersheds. And to emphasize, these can be very macroscopic features of river corridors. So right here, satellite image, this is the Columbia River, the land surface. This is about 350 meters on the side. I'm going to show you um, a movie that's going to show you this, the intrusion of river water into the subsurface aquifer. And on the top here, what you have is the vertical axis is elevation of the river surface. It's about two and a half meter range, and you can't read that scale. This is time, about 150 days. If you see the little red dot, that's going to start moving, and you're going to start to see a movie play here. So those are coordinated. So you can see this pulsing behavior is that the river's going up and down. And what's happening is the darker the blue color, the more river water you have moving into this subsurface domain. The lighter the color, basically the more brown water there is. There's, a, there's an aquifer underneath this land, and it's connected hydrologically with the surface water. 
And so this is an example of an exchange flow. The water's coming in and it's coming back out. And this is a big macroscopic feature of this river quarter, moving hundreds of meters into the subsurface domain. And that concept also of the river water mixing with the groundwater is also going to be important to move forward, forward in the top. So the main point there is a macroscopic feature. So some of our science questions, really the, the high-level science questions, are we want to understand the processes that link those exchange flows to the biogeochemical functioning of river corridors. And from a modeling perspective, then, with that fundamental understanding, how do we take knowledge of that understanding and move that into numerical mathematical models to enable prediction of function? especially in the future. So we do a lot of this work. I already showed you this image. Uh, we try to address those questions in part on the Hanford, uh, uh, the, the, the reach of the Columbia River here, the Hanford Reach. So it has a lot of nice features. It's kind of a, a natural model ecosystem to interrogate. We try to work out fundamentals in this system and put them into models and then to try to enable transferable understanding across systems. So you have rivers moving this way downstream. You have an upstream impoundment that has a dramatic influence on the hydrology moving downstream. Dams here, a lot of these big exchange flows I was just showing you. That image comes from about this location here. Kind of a cobbly bank, there's kind of tributaries coming in. There's a lot of various features of the system that we can leverage to do some interesting fundamental work. Uh, I'll tell you more about the system in a minute. So what I'm going to do now is, that's kind of a high level overview. I'm going to start to now turn towards more of the detailed science. And what I'm going to do first is go through some of our the key takeaways. And you don't need to understand those graphics at this, at this point. Um, I'm just trying to tell you where I'm, I'm going to go. And the rest of the talk is going to be telling you how we get these main takeaways. So the first one, as you may have guessed from the title, is the carbon chemistry, not just how much carbon you have. Carbon really drives biogeochemical function, right? it really in most systems. But it's not about just how much you have. It's the details of the chemistry that really matter to the biogeochemical function of the systems. That's going to be one key takeaway. Another is that I just showed you the Hanford Reach. What we're trying to do is we're going global with the kind of work I'm going to be telling you about. We're linking molecular characterization to mathematical models on a global scale. And we're doing that through a variety of ways. Field samples, new sensor technology, using high-res mass spectrometry, I'll tell you about new sensors here, all tied to models. And really the purpose of all this is again to be able to go from fundamental detailed processes to sort of Meso scale, a landscape scale uh, function in terms of river quarter, the integrated perspective, all the way to watersheds, continental scales, and ultimately the global scale. So that's kind of where we're going to try to go. Now, how are we going to get here? So let's talk about this, the field system uh, a little bit more. So here's the same, you can hopefully recognize the same sort of river corridor here you've already seen. This is this image I showed you before. I showed you the, the movie on this uh, landscape image here. That's from this location. And I'm not going to go through the results uh, of, this, of some older studies that we've done, but one thing to point out is that when that phenomenon happens, when you have that hydrologic exchange that I showed you in that movie, what happens is it stimulates respiration. You start to produce more CO2. Microbes start producing more CO2 when you're mixing groundwater and surface water together. And so the question starts to become why. Why is that happening in this system? Let's understand the fundamentals of that. And what's interesting is that Classically, in, in systems where you're getting this exchange, what happens is you have a lot of organic carbon often in groundwater. And you have a lot of oxygen in river water. When you put carbon together with oxygen, you get respiration. And you make CO2. However, in our field system, the groundwater has oxygen. Surface water has oxygen. The groundwater has very, very little organic carbon. So why are you stimulating respiration in the system when you mix those two waters together? And this is where we started to think about the organic carbon and its detailed chemistry as being the potential mechanism that's driving this stimulated activity. And so this, we kind of came up with this conceptual model where you can imagine on this end you have groundwater, low concentration of particular carbon chemistry. On this side would be surface water, higher carbon concentration, low activity in both cases. When you put them together, you're getting stimulated activity. So what we wanted to do is to test this kind of conceptual model with some real data from the field we're doing that using something called FTICR mass spectrometry. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. So FTICR mass spectrometry, um, it's, it's a really powerful technique where you can basically go to the field, take your sample, inject it on the mass spec, and it gives extremely high mass accuracy. So what you're getting out is you put the sample on there and it's looking at the organic molecules. And it's characterizing those organic molecules in terms of their mass. 
But the mass is so highly resolved in that instrument that you can actually identify and infer molecular formula. You can, you can say how many carbons and hydrogens and oxygen and nitrogens there are for every peak that you would get off of that mass spec, or at least a large fraction of them. And so what's powerful, you can do a lot of interesting things once you have a molecular formula for more molecule. One of the things you can do is you can calculate this thing called nominal oxidation state. And basically from this formula right here, the letters A, B, C, D, etc., those are how many carbons, hydrogens, oxygens you have. It's basically taking the molecular stoichiometry and calculating the oxidation state of that molecule. Why is that important? The reason is because then empirically, so the Laurent and Capellan showed a few years ago that this nominal oxidation state here on the x-axis is very nicely correlated with uh, something called a Gibbs free energy of, of carbon oxidation. Each point on here is a different kind of organic molecule. And conceptually, what's going on here is as you move up this axis, a microbe, when it takes that organic carbon and it takes electrons off of it to generate energy, for organic molecules higher than axis, a microbe gets less energy from doing that. So the point is, as you move up this axis, those organic molecules are less favorable to driving by chemical reactions. And you can infer that from, from field samples. And so this is the technique we're going to use to then look and try to evaluate that conceptual model that I was showing you. And so we have, uh, remember that the, the, the field system itself, we can take samples from across that field system, from the river itself, from the aquifer, and from zones where we have mixtures of river water and groundwater. And we can, from every one of those samples, we can calculate how much groundwater is in, the, in that sample. So from here, 0 to 1, approximately. Every sample, we can, we can take it and we can use that FTICR technique to infer, to calculate the median Gibbs free energy. Okay, again, going up this way is less favorable. So if that conceptual model has some relevance, we should see a consistent trend, a systematic trend, which we do. It's a bit noisy, but uh, what you see is that as you move towards the surface water into this continuum, you get less and less favorable carbon. As you move towards the groundwater end, you get more and more favorable carbon. And you can look at this, break this out with dissolved organic carbon concentration, just how much DOC is there. Same vertical axis. When you have high DOC, high organic carbon concentration, you have unfavorable carbon. When you have low DOC concentration, you have more favorable carbon. So let's try to interpret that again kind of conceptually. Groundwater, again, now is here on this side. These are meant to represent favorable carbon, just conceptually. There's very little of it, though. Over here is river water. These organic molecules are less favorable for a microbe, but there's more of them. So the way that we've interpreted this is that groundwater respiration is limited because there's just not enough carbon. Not enough carbon to support activity. Surface water, there's plenty of carbon, but the microbes can't access it because it's not very favorable. When you put that together, you break both those limitations simultaneously. Relative to groundwater, you increase the concentration. Relative to river water, you increase the favorability. When you do that, ooh, you get activity all of a sudden. So this is a conceptual interpretation from our field data. Um, and so what we like to do, again, thinking about how do we take fundamental knowledge and move it into models, what we like to do is then start to model this. Can we, and just this is actually a very simple exercise, can we, can we recapitulate that field dynamic by invoking the mechanisms that we're inferring conceptually? So Ken Saab here is doing this work. I'll go through this, this model just conceptually for you. Um, and what he's doing, he's setting this up where in the model, he has this pool of less favorable carbon called Z, a pool of more favorable carbon called S. So what's it kind of related to those Gibbs free energies we were looking at? And from Z, you make S, I should say that. And from S, you can basically generate resources to build enzymes that then uh, process that organic carbon. And you can build biomass. And so I'm not going to walk through these equations. The point is that it's basically a set of couple ordinary differential equations which allow you to do dynamics. You can have dynamic simulation. OK. Let's think of conceptually, what are we doing, though? River water, in the model, we're going to say river water has a high concentration of this unfavorable pool, just like we saw in the field. Groundwater has a low concentration of this favorable pool, just like we saw in the field. And what's cool with the model is you can run experiments with the model, just like you do in the lab, but you can do this in silico on a computer. We can run little games where we can 
basically simulate different different mixtures of river water and groundwater and evaluate can we see the same behavior in the model that we saw in the field data. And so this is what the output looks like. Every panel here, the x-axis is time, so this is dynamic simulation. The y-axis is a normalized concentration or abundance. You're going to have different panels here. You see groundwater 0%, 2, 4, 6, I'm not showing you these middle ones, up to 10 and 20%. And um, so the yellow line is the amount of unfavorable carbon, that's Z. If you can maybe barely see down here, you've got biomass and, and S, the favorable carbon. So when you have no groundwater, or you have 10% or more groundwater, basically nothing's going on. It's a very static system, nothing's going on. What's really interesting is if you add in a little bit of groundwater in the model, all of a sudden, holy cow, like biomass takes off, and you start degrading that uh, unfavorable carbon, making more favorable carbon, and that keeps going from 2% to about 8%. And what's really amazing is that uh, we only saw, I think I kind of skipped over, we only saw stimulated activity in the field data um, below 10% groundwater. So it actually lines up not just qualitatively, but starts to line up quantitatively what we see in the field, which helps us give us some confidence that yes, the details of the carbon chemistry may underlie the stimulated biogeochemical activity that's resulting uh, from the mixing of groundwater and surface water. Again, remember, that whole dynamic was set up because of the hydrology. The hydrology is driving that kind of mixing dynamic, and that's leading to biogeochemical response. Okay, so that's the model outcome. Now what I want to show you is, um, that doesn't really prove anything per se, and it's on its own. So I want to quickly go through a lab experiment now. So we, we can go from the field to a lab, uh, to a, a model, I mean, to, to a lab experiment, to really try to parse out the mechanism. So Vanessa Garabuda Caruso is a postmaster's with me, and she did this experiment where she's basically injecting different types of organic carbon into, into small uh, vials of sediment. This is the same figure I showed you before. Gibbs free energy, groundwater fraction. She's finding model compounds um, that represent uh, Gibbs free energies here and here, the, the blue and the purple. So these compounds here are the ones in the circle in blue, have a high Gibbs free energy, they're less favorable. In purple, they're more favorable, that here. So because you know the formula, you can calculate the Gibbs free energy. She was also manipulating whether they have nitrogen or not, and moving across three different concentrations. The way she was doing that, is basically collecting native sediment from the field system, putting in these little vials, and shaking them, injecting the carbon in there, and using a fiber optic system, which is quite nice. You can put these little dots in the inside of the vial, and you can measure oxygen concentration with the vial closed. You can keep measuring oxygen through time. And so she did this in a full factorial experiment, replicates, etc. And this is what some of the raw data look like. So on the the vertical axis, you have oxygen concentration. On the horizontal, you have time. This is a six-hour incubation from zero to six hours. What I'm showing you here is just for the three milligram per liter uh, treatment. The other concentrations looked fairly similar. The different panels are the different compounds that, that she was using. And really the key point is that you can see yet every line is a different replicate, a different vial. So you can see oxygen is decreasing quite nicely in a nice linear way uh, through time. And really, and so the slope of this line is basically a proxy of respiration rate, how much oxygen is being consumed by the microbes through time. And the next slide I'm going to show you, we're going to be looking at the slope of that line. So the steeper it is, the faster respiration is, the more carbon they're consuming. The flatter it is, the slower respiration is. So what's really cool, well, it's interesting is that her treatments actually didn't do much. But there was inherent heterogeneity in the carbon chemistry coming off the sediments that turned out to really actually drive what was going on by geochemically. So here what we have, this vertical axis is the slope of that line that we were just looking at. So this, um, the steeper it is, the higher the respiration. So the higher respiration this way. X-axis, horizontal axis, the average Gibbs free energy, energy. She was doing the same thing using the FDICR method to get the Gibbs free energy. And what you see is a pretty decent relationship where as you get more favorable carbon, you're getting more higher respiration rates. This only happens when you have relatively low organic carbon concentration. When you really crank up the carbon concentration, that relationship is gone. So a couple of key points here, though. 
What's really amazed me is that if you change, you're only changing the carbon chemistry about 10%. We're changing the flux by two folds. Okay, a small change in chemistry leads to a big change in the 5G chemical rate. Whereas if you go from 0.3 milligrams per liter to 9 milligrams per liter, you see very little change in respiration rate. So the change, a 30-fold change in concentration has a small effect. A small change in chemistry has a big effect. Just once again, like, okay, the chemistry here is really important. It's not just about the concentration. And the reason that's, one reason that's important, I, I've mentioned models a number of times. Existing models have no representation of the carbon chemistry. They put all these fancy biogeochemical reactions in models that they apply to field and in field situations, and they basically just use glucose to drive all the biogeochemistry. So they're incredibly simplified, and clearly they're missing really important parts of, of the system. Okay, so hopefully that convinces you that carbon chemistry itself is really important. So I've mentioned this FTICR method a number of times. Uh, I've sort of talked about what it is. You know, it's a high resolution uh, molecular characterization method. One of our big challenges is how do we take molecular data like that and really put it into mathematical models in order to use it to make predictions. So I'm going to walk through this. This is really new stuff. Um, by the way, I'm showing you like our newest data. A lot of stuff is not published. Um, our, our team has actually not even seen all this stuff yet. So we're getting the freshest of the fresh. Um, so Ken Saab here again, he's, he's thinking about this. We're thinking about this together, really, of how to put the FTICRA in the model. So let's step through this. You think about metabolism. You have catabolism and anabolism. Basically, catabolism generates energy. Anabolism makes biomass. Okay, so this is catabolism, anabolism, they're linked by ATP. This collectively is metabolism in a very sort of simplified cartoon way. Classic view. Kian's looking at this, especially the inner piece of this, now in, in a thermodynamic perspective in terms of these Gibbs free energies. So same thing, but now you have these Gibbs free energies in here. And you can assign the Gibbs free energy to, to how much energy a microbe can get um, or how favorable a compound is when a microbe is generating energy, how favorable it is when it's building biomass, and there's also some loss of energy that we're just assuming is constant. And remember, we can calculate these Gibbs free energies from the stoichiometry that we get from the FTSCR. So all the metabolism boils down to these putting catabolism and anabolism together, except this little lambda parameter here. And lambda is actually a function of those delta Gs. And what lambda is conceptually, the bigger lambda is, basically the more times catabolism has to run in order to build biomass. So the bigger lambda is, the less efficient the system is. The lower lambda is, the more efficient it is at building biomass. So this is a very like stoichiometric perspective, thermodynamics, there's no dynamics per se, there's no kinetics, there's no, there's no change in time. So we're going to start, start from this concept and then move here, where what he's doing is he's taking a boiled down representation of what I was just showing you, which is here, and he's, he's using some other theory to turn that into a dynamic kinetic reaction. We don't have to go through all the details, but that's, this, this is the dynamic reaction here. It's really a, a, an equation of growth. It, it models, it, it represents how biomass changes through time. And what's really interesting is that these capital Y parameters you can calculate those directly from those Gibbs free energies. So you can go from the FTICR from the field to the mass spec to the molecular formula all the way to this parameter in this model. And I should say, when you're building models for environmental systems, it is incredibly hard to figure out what the numbers are that underlie the letters. Okay, it's easy to write down a bunch of letters into an equation, but knowing what the numbers are, that is really, really hard. So we're finding a way to do this, to actually calculate what, those, what the numbers are, these parameter values. And um, so then what I want to call out is that mu max here, that is the maximum growth rate that you, can, that, you, that you can observe. The V here, this is the volume that a microbe can access and harvest uh, carbon energy from. So what does that mean? If you're a microbe in the subsurface, that volume, what it is, is how much water is passing by you in a given amount of time. The more water that passes by you, the bigger the volume that you're sort of able to access. These are, this is a concentration of carbon, concentration of oxygen, which we can measure pretty easily. So what we wanted to do is think about how can we basically determine all the parameters in this model. Okay, what a lot of people do 
is they get a model like this, and because it's hard to find out what the numbers are, what the right numbers are, they'll fit it to data, and they'll kind of tune the values until it fits the data. That's not an approach that lets you predict anything. It just lets you fit data. We want to be able to predict things, which means you need to be able to calculate the parameters directly. So here's an idea, a conceptual idea. Mu max itself, really hard to kind of measure in an environmental system. But the mu max should be governed by how well optimized microbes are to their substrate environment, to the organic carbon chemistry around them. If they're well adapted, so they should be able to grow fast. If they're poorly adapted, they should be able to, should, their maximum growth rate should be slow. So no, how, no matter how much carbon you give them, if they're poorly adapted, they're going to grow slow. That's the conceptual idea. And so then, it, then the question becomes, how do we infer how well microbes are to their environment? without doing a whole bunch of experiments. So how we're going to do this, um, and this is, this is getting really the cutting edge newest ideas. They're like three weeks old. Um, so we're going to step back, and this is another way to look at the FTICR data. Um, this is what you get from an FTICR um, analysis. So this is mass, the mass of organic molecules um, on the x-axis. This is the intensity on the y. All these peaks are different organic molecules in the sample. What's really cool is that you can take the mass difference between any two pair of peaks. You can calculate that because it's so highly mass resolved. You can ask, does that mass shift match exactly with a known transform biochemical transformation? In this example, it's the example is the loss or gain of a value. Exactly 99.07. And you can say, yes, those two peaks are shifted exactly by that mass. So you can infer that this larger peak could have lost a valine, resulting in this peak here. We have a list of about 1,200 of these transformations that we can interrogate. Any given sample, we can basically say, okay, there's you know, 10 times valine's been lost, you know, five times this other transformation has occurred. This whole profile. You can do a lot of interesting things with that kind of data. One thing we're going to do is we're going to count, just count up the number of transformations that we see in any given sample. And what's cool is that from the field data, these are from sediment samples we took from the field, take them, do the FTICR, measure a metabolic rate. The number of transformations that you infer in that sample increases quite nicely with the measured metabolic rate. That means samples that are more biogeochemically active, you can infer that uh, from the number of transformations that you get. So you can basically, now we have a proxy of how biogeochemically active sediments are. Uh, which is really how biogeochemically active the microbes are. Right? So, now, take that concept. This is sample level data. Every point is a sample. Same plot here, same exact plot. Now let's extend this concept uh, just conceptually. Now imagine if these were peak level data. So think about this. That, that, that plot I just showed you, every peak, you can say, okay, this peak is associated with 10 transformations. This peak is associated with 60 transformations. This peak is associated with zero transformations. Um, and so what we think we can say is that peaks that are involved in lots of transformations are likely the most biogeochemically important peaks, organic molecules in the system. They're the most engaged in terms of microbes interacting with organic molecules. Um, and we've shown that actually in some other ways I'm not going to show you. But if that's true, then we have a proxy in every single sample. We have a proxy for actually every single peak, how important it is to the biogeochemistry of the system, how active it is, so to speak. Then, we, then what we have then is for every single peak, we can calculate its level of biogeochemical action, if you will, as well as how favorable it is from this lambda I showed you before, and these Gibbs free energies. And then what's interesting is you start to think about this. Okay, if you correlate how active a given peak is in terms of the number of transformations it's involved in with these favorability metrics, you can come up with some conceptual interpretations that I'll go over here. So imagine you have a plot like this. This is the number of transformations a peak is involved in. Okay, so this is going to be a, basically a regression within every single sample. The number of transformations a given peak is in, uh, in, involved in. This is increasing contribution to biogeochemistry. As you move here, this is lambda. Okay, the bigger lambda is, the less efficient that molecule is in terms of um, facilitating the uh, capture of energy or, or construct, construction of biomass. So what we're saying is that if in a sample, if you have a positive correlation between these two, what does that mean? 
That means the peaks that are being used the most, the most active peaks here up here, are also the least efficient. That would suggest that microbes are using organic molecules or engaging organic molecules that are not very favorable to generating energy or biomass. To me, that means they're not well adapted to their system. Remember, what we're trying to do is get to that mu max. And so that's our conceptual interpretation. If it's negative, that means the peaks that they're heavily engaged in are efficient. That would suggest they're well adapted to the system. So, and in the middle, the flats is something in the middle. So, this is for uh, lambda, which is the whole uh, metabolic reaction, all metabolic reactions. You can do this for the anabolic portion, uh, portion in terms of building biomass, if you put these get three energies on the x axis, or the catabolic part. And same conceptual interpretations. So, every sample here that we have is going to get one correlation coefficient direction and the strength of this relationship. And we're going to interpret it conceptually. So what we can do is now we can build a two-dimensional space. On this vertical axis is going to be a correlation coefficient. Those are bounded between negative one and one. Okay, this, the higher the value, the stronger the relation, relationship, basically. So this is going to be the number of transformations versus the uh, catabolic part of the metabolism. This is the number of transformations versus the anabolic part of the and I think this is maybe the easiest way to interpret this. Every sample has to land in here somewhere. Every sample from any system in the world has to land in this space. So if the sample is here, that means it has these negative correlation coefficients, that negative dashed line from the previous slide. That's most optimized. In this corner, least optimized. And what's cool is you can break this out, where if the sample's over here, it's, it's optimized, those microbes are optimized to generate energy. From the substrates. If they're up here, they're optimized to build biomass from those substrates. So before I show you the data, I'm going to tell you how we're going to fill in that space. And this is this effort that we call Wonders. Okay, Wonders is like it's basically a global research consortium. Distributed research, it's open, it's coordinated. Uh, Clay is actually already involved in this. I didn't realize this until today. Uh, but he's already engaged, which is quite cool. You're going to see some of his data. I didn't even know it was his data um, up here in a few minutes. <laughs> so, um, focus on river corridors, emphasis on this river subsurface to surface exchange we've been talking about. And what well, we're doing a few, all kinds of things with this actually. but. First thing I want to point out, it's a big team. This is just the PNL team. We have collaborators all over the world for this. Uh, you guys can join us in this as well, I'll tell you more about that. But just to point out, there's a lot of people involved. So one thing that we're doing with Wonders is we're doing um, FTICR in surface waters, in rivers in particular, in sites all over the world. So what we do is we send, um, this is both space and time, and we send, so we have distributed sites, we send people these free sampling kits that are super streamlined and easy to use. Um, we run the data, run those samples in the FTACR. We also generate the normal chemistry, like um, cation and anion profiles, all kinds of geochemistry, microbiology as well. We pay for all that, and the data all become public, and we're developing analysis apps to help people analyze the data. It's all georeferenced, really strong, so like metadata structures, so it's super easy to use for hopefully um, most people. So, let me get people engaged in that uh, if you're interested. This is a current map. Um, we launched in December, so it's not as full as I want it to be, but we're growing. We're starting to get some sites in South America now. The red dots are spatial samples that we're getting. They're kind of one-off samples. The black dots are high-resolution time series from sites um, that really have a very dynamic river stage condition. That's just to point out that we're, we are trying to go global, but if you have friends in places that are not mapped here, I'd love to uh, talk to you to fill this out. So, that's an effort I hope you guys uh, to be aware of. I'll give you contact info for that, info for that at the end of the talk. So back to here. This is we're going to leverage that wonders effort to start to ask where sites um, fall in the space. And this is our data so far. It's not tons of sites yet, but what the what we're seeing is that systems microbes are basically either not very well optimized. They're up in this space, or they're optimized to generate energy. I should also say the color here. Is the third dimension where it's it's the uh, related to the correlation coefficient between number of transformations and lambda. Short story is the more blue it is, the more optimized it is for basically um, uh, putting catabolism and anabolism together into collective metabolism. Uh, so okay, 
So I think this makes sense though. For environmental microbial communities, um, they're usually living under limited, uh, some sort of nutrient limited conditions. They're often just trying to get by, trying to generate energy to get by as opposed to trying to grow. At least that's my conceptual interpretation. So I think this makes sense. Now again, let's remember, this is a long journey to get to new max. So here's the idea. This is, I told you, this is bounded. You cannot go outside this space. This is the very least optimized possible condition you could have. So what we're proposing is the length of that vector from that corner to any given sample is proportional to mu max. The longer the vector, the more optimized microbial communities are, the faster they should be able to grow. And what's also cool is the angle on that gives you a sense of whether they're optimized for anabolism or catabolism. So you can actually, I think, say a lot from this kind of analysis. So that's mu max. That's maximum growth rate. Basically, similar to said. Now, this is the other the other free parameter here in the model. Going back to this, we just talked about mu max. Is the volume here? What's cool is that, as I was mentioning, it has to do with how much water is moving through sediments. So now let's talk about some physical science here. Um, basically, that's basically what I just said. So, with under wonders, the same program I was just talking about. We're not just doing chemistry and the microbiology. We're also doing physical hydrology here as well uh, as some, and, uh, some geology. So what we're doing is, this is this first bullet point here, I already told you about, these water samples. That gives us the FTACR plus the carbon concentration. Remember, that's also a parameter in that model, the concentration. So we, now we have that. We developed this new sensor technology that can basically, you put it into the sediments of a riverbed, and it will tell you how much water is moving through those sediments. And I'll give you a little bit of details. And with Wonders, what we're doing is we've, we've spent a lot of money actually developing this sensor technology, and we're sharing with people for free around the world. We're sending it to people. Right now, this sensor rod is in a system in Georgia. It's a tidal system. So what we're trying, what we're trying to do with Wonders is, is generate data in a consistent way across many systems in a very open and collaborative way. And both this is to be leveraged by anyone really. Okay, so this sensor rod, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It has these two pieces, this outer rod and an inner rod. It's about a meter long. Um, it has two pressure ports. This, is, this goes into the sediments. The sediments come to here, so this is all covered by sediment. These two pressure ports, what that gives you is a vertical gradient in pressure. So water flows downhill. It, so there's a pressure gradient that, that pushes water into the system. Or if it reverses, it pushes water out of the system, up from the sediments into the river. So you can infer that gradient from those pressure points. This fluid uh, conductivity sensors, often groundwater and river water have different levels of salt, basically, in the water. And you can measure that in a vertical profile here. As embedded thermistors, those measure temperature. Often river water, groundwater are different temperatures. Gives you another piece of information in terms of whether you're seeing groundwater, river water, and how fast that water is moving. It also has these geophysical electrodes. So these are rings of metal around the rod, and there's basically injecting electricity into the sediments and measuring how much electricity you get at the next electrode. And by, um, so geophysicists in our team basically developed this, and the point is you can, you, from that method, you can infer the porosity of the sediments. And the porosity is basically how much water you can fit in between the grains. And the porosity, as you can imagine, is really important to determine how much water is moving through the system. The bigger those pores are, the more water that can move through there very quickly. So I'll show you um, this is a little uh, short video of installing the sensor rod. This is our field system. This is Doug McFarland. Uh, he's pounding in, uh, making a pilot hole. I'm really good exactly there. <laughs> and the Columbia River, John Tomlin here, he's the guy that's really physically building this thing. So he's pulling out the, the, uh, uh, the pilot hole maker. John's going to slide that into the hole. You can see it underwater. Uh, this goes right into the, into the sediments. You can see it's cable here, and that runs up to a data logger on shore. And this one data logger collects all the data and also does those geophysical surveys where it's injecting electricity and measuring um, basically the, the, the uh, electrical, electrical resistivity um, between those electrodes and for the porosity. Okay. So with that, Technology, we can get this parameter, we can get the concentration from the surface water, we can get that parameter, at least get pretty close, I think, from that uh, domain I was telling you about before, or the, uh, the, the uh, optimization sort of analysis I was telling you about, we can directly calculate those parameters. And so, 
By putting it all together, this is kind of what I was saying, is you can get mu max here, you get the flux here across lots of sites, which to me this means we are, I think, getting really close to be able to infer all the parameter values in a fairly deterministic way of reactions like this. This is for growth, but you can change this reaction very simply into respiration or other types of IG chemical reactions. And if we can do this for any system that we deploy this wonders technology to, that is a big breakthrough because now we can start to put build models in a pretty mechanistic way and parameterize them in a fairly deterministic way across systems. So that opens up huge opportunities to really improve our ability to uh, model systems and predict system function or recorder function. So let's go back to these takeaways. This is what I showed you before. Carbon chemistry is really important to the hydrobiogenic chemistry of recorders. I hope I convinced you of that. As I've told you a few times, we're trying to go global with this kind of an analysis. Taking molecular analysis, uh, coupling it with sensor technology, and putting that information directly into models. And again, the point is, to go from this really detailed fundamental understanding, like I was doing with all that FTICR analysis, and put that in the model so we can, we can take this equation right here, and we can put that into a model that we already have, actually, that, that models how water moves through the sediments. And you can represent these equations in that model at the field scale, hundreds of meters, hundreds of kilometers scale, even. And once you can do that, you're on your way to being able to model mechanistically watershed function and if you can model any, any one of these watersheds, you now offer an opportunity to start to scale that up to the whole continental, ultimately the global scale. So I want to mention very quickly um, other ways to get engaged. I mentioned wonders a few times. Another way uh, people are interested on co-leading a workshop for the Department of Energy with Kelly Wright and Owen Brody. This workshop is kind of, in a way, taking this wonders concept on putting it on steroids to understand watershed functions in a very distributed way. Same kind of thing, same kind of concepts. There's actually a lot of molecular um, pieces coming in here. We're, we're collaborating with this environmental molecular sciences lab. That's what does our FT, the lab does our FTICR for us. Also the Joint Genome Institute, they do a lot of sequencing, a lot of metagenomics, a lot of transcriptomics, a lot of detailed molecular work. KBASE is a DOE effort to provide tools to the community to try to actually analyze data that come out of these, um, these sort of instrument-based uh, institutes, if you like. And of course, putting in the models. Same kind of concept, moving detailed understanding across scales. So uh, if anyone's interested, we're going to be having our first webinar <coughs> to describe this concept in late uh, November. And there'll be white papers that we'll, we'll solicit. Uh, we'll have a second round of webinars in January. The workshop will be in late January. So if people are interested in becoming engaged in this to help influence where this is going, uh, <coughs> please reach out. Reach out to me, and I can, I can definitely facilitate that. Uh, okay, so that is actually the end. I'm going to leave with this. This is our little Wonders logo. Here's our info. This is our website for Wonders, if anyone is interested. Uh, I think there's actually a lot of opportunities. Uh, even in the classroom, we built these sampling kits in a way to enable classroom activity, not just people that are like we're real experts at taking these kind of samples. They're super streamlined. That's our email address for Wonder specifically. That's our Twitter handle. That's my email address. I do want to thank uh, Emsel here, who's a really key collaborator doing all that TICR work. Our funding comes uh, from the Department of Energy, Self Service Biochemical Research. And one other thing, Lijing asked me to mention that we have. A whole variety of intern programs at PNNL. Uh, one of them is, I don't have a link up here, unfortunately, but one of them is called SULI, S U L I. That's an internship program for while you're an undergrad. You can come work at our institution for the summer or the winter. Uh, you get paid to do that. DOE pays you to come work with us, which is pretty cool. Um, once someone's graduated, we hire a lot of post bachelor's interns. Those are usually two year appointments. And after that, if you want to do a master's with us, depending on its focus, we can sometimes fund master's work. And so we have master's interns while you're doing your master's. After you finish your master's, you can be a post-master's intern. Uh, you can just keep going. So you can do a PhD intern, postdoc, staff scientist is going to the next level after that. So um, one of the reasons I wanted to come up here is to talk to you all about these sorts of opportunities. We're always looking for new people to start working with us, bring new ideas. 
um, I do feel like there's good opportunities to connect more between what you guys are doing, your interests, etc., with what we are doing. So, with that, uh, we have a few minutes, I think, to take a few questions.